Thanks very much, uh, Lord Deer, for the introduction. As you indicated, Robert and I are going to do a double act, and in the spirit of partnership, share the slides, clear evidence of value for money in this joint enterprise. <laughs> um, hopefully, it will also demonstrate real integration, but you can be the judge of that at the end. Um, Robert will say a little bit more later on about um, the roles of LOCOG and OSD, but to help set the context here, let me just give a sentence on this. Um, OSD, part of the Home Office and firmly rooted in the public sector. Um, LOCOG is a private sector company set up under the host city contract uh, to deliver the games and it's an established part of the IOC paraphernalia. Um, it's a, at times a puzzling um, uh, institution. Um, this is a very interesting model um, but in terms of value for money it does enable a particular route to sponsorship to be taken, which wouldn't otherwise be possible. We are not constrained by the public sector European uh, legislation in terms of, of procurement, and we have um, a better position in relation to VAT than um, public sector organisations do. Um, delivery of the Games, I think, then, is a very good example of um, achieving value for money through the public and private sector uh, partnership. It is not without its challenges. Um, I spent eight years in the British Transport Police where we were funded by the industry, um, delivering what you would call, I guess, a public good. And there were the odd uh, tensions. I was used to the, uh, you want money? <laughs> um, and uh, um, got used to a, a particular style in relation to financial issues. Um, but the sort of tensions that um, will, will play out, I guess, in any public-private um, sector partnership are measures of success. Um, so a clear measure of success in the uh, private sector is shareholder uh, value, shareholder profit, so taking money out to put into shareholders. Whereas in the public sector, I think, certainly it was the case with me in the Transport Police, we were interested in delivering more and better service. Um, there were different accountability mechanisms. There was the um, accountability of the market in the private sector, where if you didn't deliver, you went out of business, as against the accountability in the public sector, which was more around uh, assurance and appropriate bureaucracy to, short, to ensure that what was being um, spent on actually produced the goods. And there are different approaches to procurement. So... Um, we don't have to compete in the private sector with the, um, the European tendering paraphernalia. Um, we can use the ITT process to actually help us define the operational requirement and beat the best deal out of the system. So there are, there are advantages in the private sector there. Um, despite these sort of challenges and tensions that uh, exist, a strong partnership is certainly possible and I think um, we would hope you would conclude the same at the end of this presentation. So. <coughs> Looks good. Um, the main points I want to make here is that the host city contract um, has required the, the Prime Minister, the Chancellor of the Exchequer and the Home Secretary to uh, guarantee the safety and security um, of people in the UK during and whilst attending the Games and to manage the financial consequences of that. Um, that's a, a fair old uh, demand. This is an enormous event, as the stats up on the uh, slide there should indicate. It's the biggest sporting event ever in the UK's history. Uh, obviously, we have lots of experience at managing uh, large-scale uh, operations in the UK, but nothing of this order. And um, self-evidently, we're going to be doing this in a very high-threat environment. Um, at the same time, we're going to have to deliver um, a whole series of um, operational challenges, we that being um, essentially the, the security forces together. Um, at Wimbledon, for example, a fortnight before the Olympics, uh, the Notting Hill Carnival during it, the Queen's Diamond Jubilee, um, all going on at the same time. So this is a massive challenge for us.
Um, although this is called the London Olympic Games, the, the venues are far wider than London, as the uh, slide there will show you. And in fact, the uh, running of the, the Games is equivalent to something like 26 World Championships at the, uh, at the same time, followed a couple of weeks later by another 20 for the Paralympics. And in addition, there's a whole range of cultural events, parties, training camps in every region across the country. We have a, the, the torch relay beginning in May, which lasts 70 days, and will be within an hour's reach of 95% of the UK's population. So this enterprise is ubiquitous. It involves local and central governments, sporting bodies, and private sector companies. Now, um, obviously, we need some framework to um, make all that work. And this is the first test of our fleet of foot, as I now hand over to Robert, who will hopefully tell you a little bit about the framework. <coughs> Thanks, Ian. There it goes. Uh, yeah, you, you can't do something as big as this without uh, having a pretty well-developed framework that brings together all of those who are going to be involved in the delivery of the enterprise. And the slide in front of you tries to illustrate uh, what we've put in place for the Olympics. Um, one reason we got the Olympics uh, was that in the UK we are pretty good uh, at this kind of stuff. And so the Olympic bid uh, itself, um, in leading to those guarantees given by the government that Ian talked about, uh, set out uh, in very high level uh, an outline of what security would be provided. But it's the kind of thing that you will all be familiar with uh, at major events, uh, major events in a high threat environment. <clears throat> what we have done since then specifically to take the work forward is develop and indeed have uh, published uh, an Olympic security strategy setting out who's involved, what the aims uh, that we seek to achieve are, uh, and focusing on five objectives. Now, uh, nothing surprising in those objectives, and uh, though I'll come to them uh, in a moment in the program sense, they are listed in those boxes at the bottom uh, of the slide, the objectives protecting people and venues, uh, preparing for um, uh, incidents or threats, um, identifying and disrupting anybody who would be a threat uh, to the Games, ensuring that we have in place the, the right command and control arrangements, the right plans and the right resources to deliver uh, the Olympic security posture. And finally, and, and uh, quite importantly, of course, engaging with all those who either would be affected by Olympic security or themselves affect Olympic security. Those five objectives and the structure that uh, we build, some of you will recognize quite a resonance with the contest counter-terrorism strategy that the government put in place, I think, first in 2003 and has since updated. And that's quite deliberate, reflecting, as I will go on to describe in a moment, uh, that the main threat uh, to the Games uh, is from terrorism. And so we have built, as far as possible, our structures dealing with Olympic security on those increasingly firm foundations uh, of the government's counter-terrorism strategy. <coughs> but just winding back a moment, uh, strategy published, those five objectives, and then supporting the strategy, a concept of operations setting out, of course, in much more detail, um, if you like, a description of what Olympic security will be across all parties involved in the security delivery, crucially perhaps for today's discussion, uh, in particular the police and the games organizers, um, and uh, to ensure that that concept of operations can be delivered, we've put in place around those five objectives, five programs of work uh, which are developing where necessary uh, the additional capabilities uh, that are needed for the Olympics and which will, as we go forward, and again, I'll pick up something of this later, uh, be the basis in support of the concept of operations through which we assure ourselves as best we can uh, in advance uh, of the operation that we are in the right place uh, to deliver the security guarantees. Um, <clears throat> as we uh, show uh, inconveniently at right angles off to the left, crucial in ensuring that we get this right is that we 
spot the risks, that we build our uh, response to those risks, we manage them well, and of course, that there is a very high level of testing and exercising between now, indeed it's already begun, and uh, the uh, delivery of the games themselves in under two years. <clears throat> what are those risks? Well, terrorist activity uh, is indeed, in our assessment, much the most severe risk that uh, the games face, both in terms of the harm to people and the uh, prospects of uh, causing the games themselves to have to be postponed or parts of it being lost. But in addition to terrorism, um, there is, of course, uh, risks from other criminal activity, serious organized crime will chase the money. There's a lot of money uh, in the Olympics, and we know uh, that in all sorts of ways uh, they are already on the case. Um, public disorder, uh, again, uh, an audience, a TV audience of billions, almost uh, just as it's the unique opportunity for the terrorist, so it's also the unique uh, opportunity for really anybody uh, who has a point to make uh, to find a vehicle on which to hang that point. Um, some of you may have noticed that uh, in the recent Winter Games in Canada, uh, on the whole a much lower threat environment, certainly in terms of terrorism, than we will experience in London. Um, the main issue that they had to struggle with, and uh, it was quite a big issue for them, was protest, uh, not just anti-Olympic protest, but the Olympics as a vehicle for everybody with a gripe. Uh, Fortunately for them, after a couple of days at the beginning, it rather played itself out, but we certainly uh, have to be prepared for that here. Um, of course, it's, it's England and it's summer, so we probably have a flood, we could have flu. <laughs> All of these things uh, could have a, a pretty substantial impact uh, on the game, so again, they're part of uh, our overall safety and security uh, work. And finally, uh, crowd management. Um, as uh, Chris Allison, who I'll talk about his role as the senior police officer involved, and I have, have said to each other on, on a number of occasions, um, we might just, just be forgiven um, if a terrorist gets through all the barriers that we try and put in that terrorist place. But I don't think we ever would be forgiven. Uh, if the crowd management went wrong. Uh, we will have very large numbers of people uh, moving in unusual <coughs> ways from new places. Um, it's a predictable challenge, uh, but it is a very significant safety challenge, and of course, as those of you who've been in the game will know, that will lead to security challenges if we don't get it right. Now, all of those risks are brought together in um, what we call the Olympic uh, Safety and Security Strategic Risk Assessment. Um, that is uh, essentially a bringing, uh, created by bringing together experts from within the safety and security fields and elsewhere uh, in the uh, security and event management world. We follow the methodologies which are used uh, by the Cabinet Office and Civil Contingency Secretariat in drawing together the national uh, risk assessment, again, trying to ensure that we've got good consistency between our day-to-day -day approach to threats and hazards and what we're going to be doing uh, in the Olympics for our Olympic approach, essentially is building on business as usual, building on what we're good at, building on the capabilities that we've got. Just pick up then, uh, the key elements uh, of uh, our strategy. Um, as Ian has said, um, severe terrorist uh, threat level, that's what we have now. Um, it dropped, as many of you will know, to substantial, a few months ago came back up again. Substantial, severe, this is a high level of terrorist threat that we'll be working in. Um, yes, uh, building on business as usual, uh, but, of course, having to maintain core service delivery. And uh, one of the issues which, um, for an audience interested in policing that we're going to have to wrestle with, 
is how much of uh, the police uh, capacity can we divert into the Olympic security operation um, without uh, causing, if you like, the back door to be open, not necessarily in the Olympics, but in any part of the police's work. That's one of our biggest challenges. Uh, framework in which all of this is being done, yes, existing constitutional framework. We are not um, taking away from the police. We're not taking away from the 11 chief constables who are responsible for those venues. And we're not taking away from LOCOG as the Games organiser uh, their responsibilities uh, for venue security. It is about ensuring that we bring all that together in an effective, integrated, coordinated way. Um, the scope of the work, as it says, venue and time focus, this is essentially about the Olympics. We are not, um, we'll come to talk about money, of course, and I suspect we might pick up some more in questions. Um, I am not sitting on um, a pot of gold uh, that enables me to subsidise uh, what we describe there as crowded places away from the Olympics. One of the challenges with the Olympics is not just the games themselves, uh, but the incredible amount of parallel event activity that will go on. Uh, UK as party for uh, 10 weeks or so across the summer of 2012. Uh, those security challenges, of course we are concerned about the threats, of course we are working very closely uh, with uh, police forces and those who would organise events, um, but uh, the uh, security responsibilities for events like that are, if you like, not directly part of the programme that, that we are building. Might well want to talk about that some more. And as I said, close coordination uh, with um, contest, the uh, counter-terrorism uh, counter strategy. Um, so just um, a quick uh, who does what. I think we've touched on most of that already. Uh, the Home Secretary, Theresa May, she uh, is the successor, if you like, to David Blunkett, who signed the guarantee uh, to coordinate all the security and emergency service activity. <coughs> um, she has established, and I was established through my directorate, Olympic Security Directorate, within uh, the Office for Security and Counterterrorism, the body that is pulling together that strategy, that concept of operations, the program of work, ensuring, if you like, that the coalition uh, is effective. Uh, the Olympic uh, Delivery Authority um, deserves a very big mention and a big pat on the back. They, of course, are the builders for the uh, new uh, structures, uh, the stadium at the Olympic Park and so on. And, of course, the story that you don't hear about the London Olympics, uh, which has been the story that so many we remember notoriously at Athens, but even at Beijing as well, is uh, anything about the non-availability of the facilities. There is a fantastic piece of work being done by ODA to put those things in place on time and with confidence. What they are also doing uh, in the background very successfully um, is ensuring that those facilities have got uh, all the security that we need built in. Um, some of you may be aware of the secured by uh, design policies and processes, ODA, an uh, absolute exemplar uh, when it comes to that work. Um, and finally, um, the police and LOCOG. Um, Jeffrey, you said, would you, w will there be any differences between Ian and, and uh, the government and me uh, as we go through today? Well, we'll find out. Um, very often, um, we have shared a platform with Chris Allison, who is Assistant Commissioner Allison, the National Policing Lead. I think one thing that we are doing in London, um, which doesn't happen uh, very often, uh, or in the experience of uh, the Olympic organisers, the International Olympic Committee, is that we are this far out able to share a platform and, and share a story, and we're often pleased to do that with Chris Allison. And I think actually in many ways when the IOC, the International Olympic Committee inspectors come to town, the fact that we can share a platform tells them all they need to know because they are certainly just not used to that, uh, that far out. But anyway, um, just to uh, wrap up on the main players, Chris Allison, uh, National Olympic Security Coordinator, 
uh, assistant commissioner in the Met, brings together in a way that those of you familiar with if, uh, the counterterrorism model, John Yates' role as the Met lead, but also the national counterterrorism lead. Um, Chris will coordinate uh, policing throughout the country in association with but respecting uh, the uh, operational uh, independence and operational rights of the 11 uh, venue chief constables. And then finally, um, LOCOG, at which point I think I'll hand back to Ian well, well to pick up what LOCOG's up to. Well done. Thank you very much. Right, I'm going to say something about what I think we managed to achieve so far and try and relate this to the sort of public uh, sector meets private sector debate. The first one is we have, after a um, extended period of negotiation, uh, achieved um, a high degree of clarity around our roles and responsibilities. And the sort of the, the, the root cause of this, I guess, were um, there's something called the Green Guide, which is a government-owned document which requires responsibilities to be embraced by event organisers. And there's something called an Olympic model, which, given the IOC is a, uh, uh, a private sector enterprise, has defined, since the world began, the responsibilities of the organising committee. And the two of these were not wholly aligned, I think we have to, it's fair enough to say. So we, after an extended period of negotiation, have actually found a way through that. And I think that's quite a, an interesting example of where um, conflict can exist and you can find your way through it in the public-private sector debate. Around um, governance, we've now got a much better way of doing joint business. So I chair something called a venue security delivery board, which has representatives from all of the parties that Robert alluded to earlier on, the, you know, the ODA, the OSD, the OPC, uh, et, GOE, et al. Um, and that deals with all of the uh, operational choices, all of the sort of operational issues that we need to deal with. And then Robert uh, chairs a board to which we report, which is called the Venue Security Integration Board, which principally deals with integration, as the name suggests, and sort of broad value for money issues. Um, given that we are spending some of the government's money, this is a very interesting um, setup. Uh, the, in order to maintain the procurement status of LOCOG as a private enterprise, um, its procurement choices have to be defined um, by LOCOG and not by other bodies. So we have an interesting challenge around um, the use of public sector money by private sector companies. We found a way through this um, which does enable government to discharge its responsibilities in terms of public money in a way which doesn't actually um, inhibit uh, LOCOG's procurement um, capabilities. Um, in terms of the um, refining of the security costings, um, the, the recession has its role to play in our choices um, of security paraphernalia and we are working our way through a range of options for government eventually to put its stamp of approval on. Um, in terms of the risk assessment process there has been a, I think an outstandingly good multi-agency activity across private and public sector to agree a risk assessment framework which has been applied to all of the venues across up and down the country in a consistent and coherent way. Um, the sponsors clearly come from the private sector and um, they, without them the, the game simply would not exist and they therefore want their measure of influence on um, what happens where and when and we have to blend their ambitions in with those of other parties including, uh, of course, um, the OSD and others in the public sector. Bridging the Gap is um, another good example of where uh, public sector and private sector have, have come together. Um, in essence, the requirement for security guards for the Olympic Games will be something in the region of eight to 10,000. 
Um, the security industry is not going to be short of other jobs to do um, during the time of the Olympics. You can see all the pressures that will be put upon them. So there will be undoubtedly, if nothing happens, a significant shortage. We have embraced uh, the support of educational colleges up and down the country to um, uh, develop courses which provide for qualifications in security and that, that measure of support will be vital to us in providing the appropriate number of uh, private sector security people during the Games. And the oversight of that contract will have to be managed by <coughs> the manpower contractor who we are currently in the business of trying to identify. On the, the corporate personal and information security issue, this is another interesting example of the challenges of where public sector meets the private sector. Um, the government has a long-established paraphernalia for managing um, information which is sensitive across the various categories. LOCOG um, has been in existence for a few years, three or four years, but basically up to about this moment in time has not had the need to engage around information of a um, restricted level and above. Um, it's only going to exist for another couple of years when it will uh, dissolve. Um, and the level of investment in infrastructure that has been made in government over a long period of time would make no sense at all in terms of the management of information over a two-year period. On the other hand, this information is, is very sensitive and it's very important that it is shared. So we've had to work our way through um, this dilemma, um, taking a, a, an intelligent risk-based approach to it. Um, and again, I think we found a satisfactory um, route through that by modifying our activities within LOCOG and by making sure that we only receive what we need and that we produce information internally um, in batches which don't render its collective value um, at such a, a level as to attract uh, restrictions on its level of circulation. So, I mean, we've made a lot of progress in a lot of areas. Um, what are we up to at the moment? Um, out of the roles and responsibilities debate, we collected a fair amount of work in cost terms, roughly a 300% um, a increase in what we were originally doing. So we are having to engage a lot more people to do this work. And in selecting those staff, we are cognizant of the relationships that we need to maintain. So we're getting ourselves a decent mix of, of public and private sector so that we've got the right skills and value sets in the organisation. So a mix of police, a mix of army, a mix of private sector um, security people. Um, in terms of the statement of intent, um, we have to have a relationship with most forces up and down um, the country because although not all have Olympic venues, they will be involved in um, a number of different ways in support of those Olympic venues. So we're having to develop a memorandum of understanding which um, provides a convincing framework for a private sector body to work with public sector police forces up and down the, the country. We've also had to produce um, a, uh, or in the business of producing a CONOPS, which actually is simply a storybook of how um, the games will be run. Um, again, there we have some interesting challenges between what is a standard UK framework of operation in the police, the public sector generally, and historically the way the Olympic Games have been run in several different global locations by a private sector enterprise called the OCOG of, of, of choice of the particular country. So we've had to bring together um, the language um, and the assumptions, uh, the different assumptions which those um, different groups have. Um, in terms of sort of uh, venue security plans, um, we are creating them jointly with colleagues in the police service, developing the operational requirement. But again, we need to be careful around how we develop the operational requirement because of the procurement implications if we um, get too heavily involved with uh, others in making those choices. 
Um, the assessment awarding of contracts is underway. The, the manpower contract, the search and screening contract are in the business of being currently negotiated. Uh, and in terms of business continuity, we need to have a sort of plan B to make sure that we can keep the, the show on the road, uh, not only in terms of ourselves but our suppliers, and to make sure that there is a coherence between our plans and those of um, Robert and others partners in the public sector. And at that point, I will hand back to Robert. Thanks, Ian. I'll just finish off with a sort of, and where are we, and what do we think the challenges are, if you like, from my perspective, from, from the government's Olympic security perspective. Um, well, first of all, um, on time and on budget, um, in your packs, uh, I think there's a slide that talks about Olympic security budgets, uh, and we'll refer to the £600 million envelope announced by the previous government for policing and wider security. That's part of the 9.3 billion overall public sector package. And um, uh, that simple statement on time and on budget uh, is true. Uh, so quite an achievement, I think, at, at this stage, <coughs> and not without some history in getting there. But nevertheless, that's, that's where we are. Uh, we have got to the point uh, where we have defined uh, nearly every additional capability that we think needs to be put in place and right, got the work underway. That's what we mean by the commissioning process. Right? The government and the delivery partner, usually the police, but not exclusively the police, uh, have agreed what's needed, and that's now happening. Delivery is underway for a number of major projects, uh, colleagues might recall. The biggest of those, which was uh, and the additional air wave capacity that uh, that contract was um, let, uh, I think coming up for a year ago now, and that's well on into delivery. Um, I've already mentioned the Winter Games uh, in Vancouver, and we've had the opportunity to absorb some of the lessons uh, from there. The police, in particular, uh, have had fantastic cooperation from uh, Bud Mercer, who uh, led the policing operation for the uh, Mounties and we've had great uh, sharing and able, I think we saw everything that we could possibly have hoped to uh, over there and the experience that they've had, um, the parallel events challenge which perhaps we will talk about some more and the key importance of integration, the partnership working again, that's come out to us very clearly uh, from Vancouver. Um, the concept of operations um, which I mentioned in describing the framework, um, that's not a one-shot uh, event that says we've got to version four, there'll be several more versions before we get to the end. We're keeping up uh, with the game as it uh, develops both in the sporting and event world and as it develops in the security environment. So it's obviously quite a challenge uh, to, with something that is as complex and needs as much planning also to follow the moving ball uh, uh, of the threat but that is what we're seeking to do. Um, support from uh, a new government, well, uh, of course, uh, we're the government servants and uh, we're bound to get support for it in one sense, but um, the avid readers of the political texts may have spotted um, back in March that the Conservatives produced uh, a security green paper, it had a section uh, about uh, the Olympics in which uh, the Conservatives said that uh, when they arrived uh, they would want to have a quick look at whether everything that is necessary uh, for Olympic safety and security is being done, um, but subject to finding that it is, they were not minded to change the overall strategy, plans and processes. And um, that is in fact where we find ourselves and therefore that last the penultimate point I make on there about strong governance arrangements, I think uh, Ian's described uh, some of the structures that we've recently set in place to ensure that LOCOG and the government and the police in particular uh, are operating well together in the venue for, um, environment. But across the whole Olympics, we have now got uh, uh, effective uh, arrangements at ministerial level 
and at uh, senior official and delivery agency level looking at uh, the Olympic safety and security need. So uh, that's, again, a significant achievement uh, for us two years out. Um, and we must be telling some of the story well, because as that last point says, 76% uh, of those asked uh, had that confidence about 2012. Uh, I hope we can uh, maintain that through the, the two years to, uh, to go. Um, um, to, it will not be straightforward. There will be a lot of people uh, inevitably looking for uh, holes in what we're doing. Obviously, if there are any holes in what we're doing, we need to know about them. But maintaining that public support is important to us. Uh, so what are the things that are worrying us uh, at the moment? Well, I mentioned uh, the audit and review. Baroness Neville Jones, who's the security minister, uh, is uh, conducting that. I think we're nearly at uh, the end of it in discussion with her. Uh, there will be a number of recommendations, um, but they're pretty much at a detailed level. I think it is fair to say the overall take on uh, from that uh, is that what we're doing, I think, meets the needs that the new government uh, feels should be addressed. The big difficulty, of course, uh, is the pressure on public spending. Um, I may be on time and I may be within budget, but if the budget goes down, uh, that is going to be uh, something that we have to accommodate ourselves to. The new government said that the Olympic were not uh, immune from the search for savings in public expenditure over the next uh, three years. Uh, at the same time, of course, they've given a commitment to, if you like, the quality of the Olympics, and I know that Olympic security is high on their concerns. Uh, we uh, will be looking to the needs that LOCOG have, which uh, Ian has described and how they can be accommodated within the public spending uh, envelope uh, where that is necessary. Um, so that's uh, obviously a big issue. Uh, the spending review, I think, announcement is on the 22nd of October. Uh, so it's a big issue, but it's a short-term issue, and we go forward from that, uh, I hope, with the last uh, 18 months, 18 to 20 months, on a firm budgetary and organisational platform. But over that period, as I said, threat levels and methodologies may change. I think um, there are people in the room with much greater CT expertise than I have, I suspect. However, it is the methodology rather than the, whether it's critical uh, that may be the big issue uh, as we get towards the Games. If something new uh, uh, arrives on the scene, our ability to deal with that, of course, will be a significant challenge. Uh, and then running through those last uh, three points, functions, if you like, of the complexity of what we have to do, getting it all integrated across uh, the uh, agencies and departments involved. I've talked about uh, the, the, the main ones involved, but there are, I think, at the last count, about 20 different uh, agencies involved in the delivery of some aspect of safety and security for the Games, assuring uh, the plans that they have so we go forward uh, with um, the uh, greatest confidence that we can uh, in those guarantees that we've uh, given and through that uh, next two years moving from planning to operations again colleagues in the room will have much greater experience than I of some of the challenges that we face but we look working very closely with Ian and with the police to ensure that goes as smoothly as possible Last lap in. Okay. <laughs> um, perhaps as an example of the um, typical generosity of spirit uh, in this partnership, I get the first word and the last word. So, thank you, Robert. Um, so, in this joint measure, uh, venture, how do we measure success? Well, they're up on the screen there. In, in essence. You know, we don't get any attacks. Um, we deal with any aberrations um, as they occur. We make sure this remains a sport event with a security overlay um, and avoid the temptation to um, provide the reverse. And we end up with the UK's reputation 
uh, intact and hopefully enhanced because if we really wanted to screw up, this is probably the best opportunity any of us will get in our lives to penetrate all four corners of the globe um, in terms of the television coverage that uh, these events will attract. Um, these measures of success are clearly the same for both of us. And how are we going to do this? Well, essentially through a sort of business as usual, tried and tested approach um, by successfully managing not only the events um, of the games, but day-to-day -day activities which go on around it, what I call the Olympic overflow with ubiquitous live sites up and down the country, and making sure all of this activity is integrated. And that's a major role for Chris Allison uh, and his team that, that Robert alluded to earlier on. And to do this, and I guess this is the point really around um, the presentation here, is we're going to use the strengths of the public sector in terms of governance, professional knowledge, um, assurance processes, and also the strengths of the private sector around delivery and freedom from many of the commercial uh, operating constraints that um, the public sector faces, and using the very strong um, commercial negotiating skills that are available to us. And both Robert and I are absolutely confident that the UK's reputation will indeed be intact and enhanced in September 2012 as we sail off um, into the night, um, probably at that stage, I suspect, on separate boats. Um, the partnership will probably be fed up with the teeth of each other by then. But um, ho hopefully we'll have a, a happy ending to this, and I'm pretty confident that will be the case. So thanks for the opportunity to present today, and that concludes the double act.